Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the electricity metering obligation training. Uh, my name is Amy and I have joining me today Dave Wright and Helen Fosbury. Uh, so before we begin, there's just a couple of bits of housekeeping that I'd like to go through with you. Um, the session is being recorded and the recording and the slides for this event will be made available on the REC portal um, later next week. If everyone could please keep their microphones and cameras off unless speaking, it would be greatly appreciated. So today we will be using Slido um, and you can use Slido to raise any questions that you may have. So to ask a question, you can scan the QR code that's currently on screen with your smartphone. Um, you can do that through your camera app or alternatively, you can take the number that's on screen and type that into slido.com. If you're using the desktop app for Teams, you will see an S at the top of this call where you can click and access Slido as well. Please feel free to raise any questions that you may have as they come to you throughout the session. We will have a designated section for Q&A um, at the end of each agenda item. So I will now pass over to Dave and he will take us through the agenda for today. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Emma. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Wright. I was the technical assurance manager for Empower um, before leaving to become a um, consultant. <coughs> and currently consult with the AMO uh, and various organisations and metering companies. Um, I would I also sit on the um, retail energy energy code uh, change panel as the um, dual fuel metering expert. So REC asked me to um, put three sessions together. This is session two of three. Um, our first one, we, we looked at the gas industry and how the gas industry works. This one looks at the electricity industry. Uh, and the third one is um, a culmination of, of, of activities which look at how the REC and the transition to REC uh, and how the change panel and everything else work and the governance process within REC. And that's in two weeks time. So um, for those of you that have, have, uh, are new to this industry or um, are just looking to refresh some knowledge, some of this will may be new, some of it will be existing and some of it will be completely just as a refresher. So um, what we're going to go through is each section split up. So as, as Amy rightly says at the end of each section, if you've got any questions or anything like that, or you think of questions you go, as you go through, just um, put them into the chat and we'll, we'll pick those off as, as at the end of each session um, or if you if you've got questions during that that session that's great um, so we'll look at who's who in the industry um, then we'll have a look at installation uh, and what we mean by installation and who's responsible uh, then we'll do some stuff on navigating the rec portal for some people who are steeped in that that have been in there uh, they will be used to that um, for others, it will be a, a, a something completely new. Uh, and then we'll just do an open Q&A session uh, and look into close um, around about half, half three. So without further ado, Amy, unless anybody's got any questions before we start, um, we shall, we'll, make a, we'll make a start. OK, so who's who? So if you want to go to the, the next slide, Amy, please. So the interesting thing being is um, before everything was split up, um, everything was un under one, one organisation. Now, when we go through this session, um, we are not going to be talking about Manx. So, um, so Isle of Man, because they're under their own separate utility. We're not going to be talking about Jersey and Guernsey, uh, again, as separately managed and, and so, so is Northern and Southern Ireland. So we are only looking at um, England, Scotland uh, and Wales. So within the partners, parties um, years and years ago, um, before it was all sectioned up, um, when the government decided to section up, each region were given a, a distribution network operator region. So depending upon which region you live in, um, you will be looking at one of the, one of these so from you know from scottish and southern who if you notice um strangely enough have the scottish part and the more southern one of the more southern parts so um they they look after those areas western power division um looking through wales and down into Torquay and De devon uk power networks predominantly london and, and in east anglia 
Northern Power Grid, uh, looking down the down the, the um, east coast, um, and, and electricity northwest. Surprisingly, in, in, in the northwest, uh, with SP Energy um, taking North Wales, Cumbria, uh, and, and areas into Liverpool, uh, and up to, up, up into uh, the, the south of Scotland. So, if you just go onto the onto the next page, um, Amy, please. So the distribution network networks themselves and how these operate and how they are split up um, is based on uh, a number of interconnectors um, backwards and forwards. So you have a number of parties within this. You've got the generators um, who are responsible for the generation of electricity. Uh, and you'll probably heard on the news recently about um, the number of generators um, and issues that we're having with generation within the UK and the discussions around whether uh, we're going to have blackouts or all sorts of other stuff that's going to be happening um, as, as we go through into winter. Now, I'll come on to uh, some of the reasons for that. Now, there, there are a, a, a number of challenges that we, we've got. One of the biggest challenges that we assumed that they were going to have um, was the import of gas. And for anybody who joined us last time for the, for the last gas slides, uh, when we did the gas type area, you will probably be aware that actually for, for gas, we take in less than 1% gas from Russia. Um, whereas your know, France, Germany, Norway and all those other areas taking absolute huge amounts from all sorts of different locations. And that's caused them um, potential issues as as they've gone as they've gone through. So whereas for us it's slightly different. So if you look at the generators, we've no, we've a number of generators from gas, coal, oil fired, nuclear, which um, divides opinion to say the least. Um, it's probably one of the greenest ways of uh, of creating um, electricity. However, the the byproduct um, and the half life of the uranium or whatever they're using to to generate it um, takes some getting rid of, and it doesn't die for a long, long time. So we've started to use other things like solar, wind, hydro uh, and even tidal. And I'll show you some of the ratios in, 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 a, in a bit. So um, for bringing the, the electricity through um, the network itself, you can see then that in the middle of the screen, you've got a number of um, transmission lines. Those transmission lines um, it's not the clearest of pictures, but um, in effect, it's the electricity network, the high voltage electricity network that's owned by National Grid. Um, and they're responsible for the transmission and, and the grid in effect around the country. In the bottom left, you can actually see that there are a number of cables coming in and out of the country. Um, and if you've listened to the news just recently, you'll have heard that we have been importing gas, uh, electricity from um, from France, from Norway, from Denmark. Uh, and there are a number of undersea interconnectors, some of which are, are quite large, um, some of them are which are still being built and won't be ready for a few years. Uh, and some of them that we've been using for a number of years. Now, the whole idea of that was to support the UK um, with bringing electricity in from other areas and other, uh, other countries where we had a shortfall. The other way it could work is if we're generating more than we're actually using it was to export it to other countries and, um, and therefore sell it on. So it should work both ways. Predominantly at the moment, um, it's a bit of a mix and match. We have had areas where we've had to bring lo lots of amounts in, but we've had other times where we've actually been able to, to sell it on to other organisations. Once you've gone and left 
um, the national grid system, it then becomes uh, a DNO uh, or IDNO responsibility. Uh, and they are two separate companies. So your distribution network operators, which we looked at on the first slide, your Northern Power Grids, your WPDs, so Western Power Division, Scottish and Southern, they're distribution network operators. And I'll, I'll show you how that works in a minute. In between those though, um, so on the end of those networks, you can have what they call IDNOs, um, independent network operators. And the reason that they have those is that what can happen is a distribution network operator may take a supply into a certain area. So let's say for argument's sake, in the, in the middle of the countryside, um, a new housing estate is going to be built. Now, what will, might happen is the distribution network operator will only take the, the cabling so far and terminate it at a local substation. It will then be, become an independent network operator um, to take that further to distribute it to the individual houses and around the, the, the area. Uh, and, and therefore you get pockets of in IDNO sat within DNO areas. And the only way that you can take, tell the difference is from the MPAM. So from the meter and point administration number, they have a different number from what the local DNO would have. And you can find all those on the Energy Networks Association website uh, and various other places. OK, Emma, if you want to pop to the next slide, please. All right. So just some of the statistics that, that these are, are currently live statistics. So. And, and these numbers surprised me when I first first started to look at them. So there are more than 2000 electricity generation stations in the UK. Now, what you've got to remember is that takes into account small scale generation as well. Now, I don't mean by that of, you know, somebody with solar panels and, uh, you know, with battery storage or anything like that. What I mean is small organisations that have their own micro generation stations. And that can include places like hospitals, breweries, Places that don't want interrupt, un, un, they need uninterruptible power supplies, but when they're not using the power, they will sell it back to the national grid. So if you look at the split of electricity in the UK, um, in effect, 29% domestic and 29% 29 industrial. It's a reasonable steady split between, between the two. Um, if you look at the vast scales, that industrial companies used, you are talking round about 54 million um, domestic customers. So if they're using the same amount as industrial customers, you can understand the volumes. 18% commercial um, and then 8% losses. Now then, when we say 8% losses, it doesn't mean that we've got an open end somewhere and the electricity is falling out of it. The production of electricity is not a one for one scenario. So as you use it, you don't get all the electricity at the end of it. Unfortunately, as it goes through a transformer, as it heats up, as, as there's resistance, you lose an amount. Uh, and currently within the industry, that's uh, that's estimated at eight percent. What you've also got to understand is within those losses as well, there's some of it, it could be tampering. Um, so tampering, a meter tampering is, is, a, is a massive business. Um, at the moment, it's estimated at around 110 to 120 million pounds a year, uh, costing losses um, through meter tampering. Now, that's not to say that, that we lose all that money. Uh, much of it is recovered, but that you're talking at a vast scale. Energy industries, um, so the likes of you know your power stations and everything else using their own en en energy. Five percent public, uh, public administration, so your street lighting and those type of activities. Two percent transport um, doesn't sound a lot, so a lot to a lot of your trains and uh, and that type of activity, and one percent agriculture. So you can get a rough idea of where um, the where the usage of the electricity is around the UK. 
So I mentioned about interconnectors. There are currently five inter interconnectors currently in use. Um, there is a new one that's just started and that's the Viking one that's going up into Norway. Um, and that's the latest project that's just started and it's not due to finish to between five and seven years. Um, so that's that's an ongoing one. Uh, when we talk about grid and distribution network operators and independent no network operators, so the high voltage transmission system comprises of around about 24,600 kilometres of overhead lines uh, and 100, 100 uh, sorry, 1,000 kilometres of underground cables. Uh, and the distribution network operators manage about 800,000 kilometres of overground and underground cables. So when you think about that, and then you talk about a meter operator, a meter operator uh, or a MEM as they're now, now listed, uh, so a meter equipment manager, um, only deals with about two meters on the end of it. But if you think about it between them, they are dealing with about 54 million two meters. So in the grand scheme of the things, they, they, they're quite, uh, quite big. And then finally on to suppliers, and there are some disputes around these numbers. Um, so if you look somewhere, it says that there are actually 32 current registered suppliers. If you look in other places, it'll say there's 100, but active at the moment, there is around about 37 registered dual fuel suppliers. And over the last 12 months, approximately 70 have ceased, ceased trading. Um, and that's for various issues. So where they've been bought out by other companies, where they've merged or where they've suddenly um, been unable to trade because of the volatility of the market. All right, thanks, Amy. Next slide. OK. So one of the things I wanted to show you is you can actually access this site. It's called Grid Templar um, and it's Gridwatch. And basically what this shows you on the Friday that I put the slides together is the usage around the country um, of where we're getting our demand from and how much that particular demand is. So if you look in total uh, on the left hand side, our demand at that time um, was round about 32.96 gigawatts of power. Uh, and for those that you understand how it works, we're supposed to be round about fifth generating about 50 hertz. Now, there is a, def a definitive reason why we generate at 50 hertz. Um, 50 hertz is, is the, the sine wave in effect of, so um, AC current, alternating current, goes positive, then negative, positive, then negative. So it goes in a cycle. And the reason that we stick at 50 hertz is if any of you go to uh, nightclubs or anything like that and they put a strobe light on, you can see that it makes things look like they've stopped moving. Now, fluorescent lights, LED lights and standard standard lights, if we go much less than 50 hertz, it becomes a flicker effect on those lights. So can you imagine working somewhere where there's rotating machinery? It would actually make the machinery look like it's stopped and therefore it becomes dangerous. And that's why we stick above the 50 hertz level so that you don't get that effect. So if you look um, at where we were generating our electricity, 54% um, were coming from combined gas turbine. So that's what the CCGT is. So we were generating 17.95 gigawatts of electricity uh, for the whole of the country using gas. Uh, and this was one of the reasons why I mentioned earlier uh, of why the gas is so important um, for the generation of electricity currently and why they were talking about blackouts. If we couldn't produce enough gas into the country, there was a risk that we may not be able to pro produce enough electricity to maintain everything else. There are other sources, so you can see nuclear. Um, we were generating near full nuclear capacity at 5.4 gigawatts. Now that only gives us 16%, 17% of the country's need. And on that day, uh, we were producing 11% on wind. And then you can see the, the other dials are a little bit small, but it goes into solar, it goes into uh, other smaller generation 
and demand type activities. But if you ever get a chance to have a go and have a look at that, it will tell you what the live demand is at that current time and where we're producing it from. You can also see on the, um, the interconnectors where they were pulling or pushing power in or out of the country from other areas. So every one of these things will affect the price uh, and, and dependent on where we are and at what time of the day uh, or night, uh, how, what the weather's like, will depend upon where we get the majority of our electricity from. All right, thanks, Amy. OK, so. What I wanted to do then is, is say, right, OK, if, if that's all the players that are um, and how the, the network works in, in, in that region, who do we have to deal with um, throughout the whole of the industry? So Ofgem, everybody will have been aware of, uh, or, or when it was originally um, offer. So it's fair to say that the, the combination of the, the REC bringing things to dual fuel, when the REC's not the first place to do this, Ofgem did this years ago, uh, where they decided actually, the management of, of electricity and, and uh, gas and, and various other things actually can, can sit under one regulator. It can sit under one uh, regime uh, and they combine them both into, in, into off-gem. Uh, and that still stands today, but they are more in relation to customer type activity than anything else. So they, they are the guardians of the, of, of, of the pricing and, and uh, customer um, fairness, um, just more to say anything else. Decusa, um, so distribution connection use of system agreement. This one works between suppliers and distribution network operators. And it's a code which states that these are the rules that both parties um, sign up to and agree to, to operate within the market. So for argument's sake, they are reporting lines that says distribution network operators will work in a certain way, that they'll respond to issues within certain timescales, that they will keep the lights on, that they'll do repairs in certain, certain timescales. And if a supplier needs them to rectify a fault, that these are the agreements that are put in place and how it works. So there was a, a big document. Now, originally that document um, sat under um, sat under Electrolink and it still sits there currently. Um, it still sits outside the wreck. Top right hand corner you see the British Standards Kite Mark. So the BS Kite Mark uh, and the, the reason I put this in here is that all the metering, all the equipment, anything that we fit within the UK still has to comply with the British standards. So even though we have still a number and a massive number of CENLEC or um, Central European standards that we have to comply with, we also still have to comply with the British with, with British standards. So for argument's sake, any fusing, so a fuse that um, is supposed to work and operate at a certain temperature of a certain load, every one of them will have um, a British standard to them. So some of the big cartridge fuses that we use in domestic properties come under British standard 88. So there, there are BS 88 fuse. Um, your British standard for electrical wiring 7861. Um, so the 18th edition wiring regulations. Again, they're all comes under under British standards. So even though there is an influx, uh, an influence from fr from Europe, um, the British standards still apply. Um, and it is interesting for, for equipment and things like that, because you will recognise that on the back of every piece of equipment that you've now got, electrical equipment, it says 230 volts. For the most of the UK, we're actually still operating at 240, which we have been for years. And that's because there's a loophole in the law that basically says it has to be plus or minus a certain percentage. And keeping it at 240 still allows us to sit within that percentage. So for some of the infrastructure, they never changed it. It still runs at 240. Um, you've then got health and safety executive, which we've got absolutely no choice but to comply with. 
uh, they will they hold the powers um, that says if you don't do as you're told, um, if you misbehave or something goes wrong, they're the ones that are going to prosecute you. Uh, and a lot of our legislation, regulation uh, and everything else, and even the stuff in the REC is overarched and overseen by this. So for any meter operator, for any distribution network operator, for any supplier, um, whatever you're doing, we've got to comply with the HSE legislation and that hasn't changed. You've then got GemServe. Um, so GemServe are a, a, uh, an organisation that um, does a lot of secretariat work. So they managed um, the Macopa, which you can see on the right hand side there. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. But GemServe are also now responsible for a lot of the REC uh, and the, the retail um, electricity code, um, energy code, sorry, um, documents and everything else. And while I mentioned the Macopa, the Macopa, and I'll come back because this would, has disappeared now and I'll show you how and why. So the Macopa stands for Meter Operator Code of Practice Agreement. And it is the agreement that all what used to be called MOPs, so meter operators, had to comply to. Uh, and it's the code of practice that says if you are going to go fit a meter out on site, here's the skill levels, here's the information, here's the documentation, here's the audit protocols and how it should be connected whilst on site. Um, uh, that still exists, but it exists in a slightly different guise now. Electrolink I mentioned because they look after the Dakusa, uh, and then you've got um, Electrom. So Electrom managed um, things like the Marasco, so the data transfer catalogue in effect, and the uh, BSCP, so the, the uh, British Standards Code, the Balancing and Settlement Codes of Practice. Those still sit under there, uh, and this is one of the things that's still ongoing and a discussion between REC and Electron is that you've got two sets of metering codes that actually sit in two different locations. There is a cross code steering group that works between the two, uh, but it's ensuring that we still have compliance with both codes of practice. So Electron holds for argument's sake codes of practice one to ten. Um, of how a metering system should be fitted and what it's supposed to do uh, from a settlement perspective. Whereas the Macopa hold the technical information of how do you do it? Where does it sit? Uh, and what codes of practice do I need to apply on site? So they are two distinct items, but both have to be complied with. Uh, and the last two that you can see on there, um, Department for Business and Energy Industrial Strategy, so BASE, and Office for Products and Safety Standards. So the Office for Products and Safety Standards are a part of BAE's. Um, they are responsible for ensuring the accuracy of the metering equipment um, that's fitted on the wall and that it maintains its accuracy. So years and years ago, when we fitted a meter, um, they came under a certification program. Uh, which basically meant that they were tested to a certain standard and therefore that it was that meter was given a lifespan and then every so often the number were taken uh, and the lifespan could be checked and tested and extended so for argument's sake a meter may have been given a 20-year life cycle and in effect that was what's known as its cert life so in effect you went out fitted that electricity meter on the wall and you left it alone for 20 years, apart from a meter reader going and reading it, that was it. Uh, it never got touched. So from that perspective, um, we knew that every type of meter out there conformed to a certain standard. That all changed. Um, meters now fall under what they call MID, so the Measurements Instruments Directive. Now, for any of you that drink, um, and, and I don't drink, if anybody knows me, they, and they know that that's not true, but um, in effect, if you've got a pint glass, if you look on the side of a pint glass or you look on the side of a glass now, you'll see an M in a square box and a number. If you ever see that sign, it means that it falls under the Measurements Instruments Directive. So anything that measures anything has to comply with the Measurements Instruments Directive. A metering fell under the same strategy. 
So if you ever go look at an electricity meter now that's one of the new ones, you'll notice an M and then a number off on, on the side of it. The number at the side of it relates to the year. So in effect, if a meter was built this year and was fitted this year, it would have said M22 on it. And that's how we can identify the year. Now, what happens now is that Bayes will produce a document that basically says any meters, so whether it's gas or electric, have to be have to be sample tested every so many years. So what they will do is they write to the suppliers and they write to the uh, and the suppliers will then write to their meter meter equipment managers and basically say, can you do me a favor? Bayes have asked for so many of these to, to be tested. And what we have to do is we have to submit a document to them that which basically says we have this many of this type and this registered meter on on the walls in customers properties. Bayes will then summate all that document up and go right okay in effect there are x amount of thousands of this type of meter and as a supplier you own three percent of them. So therefore you need to be taking x percent off the wall. Um, and there is a maximum and minimum that you can actually can actually take off. They'll submit those back within a certain time scale back to um, Office of Product Safety Standards. They'll test them and go, right, OK, that meter is now allowable to stay on the wall for the next three or six years. And then at that point, we'll do the whole thing again. So you can imagine on the year one when we, when we first started to do this, that was the first year that we put any meters in. We didn't have to do anything for three years or six years, depending on whether it's gas or electric. And then after, say, for argument's sake, six years, we take the first one off the wall. The next year, we take the next set off the wall. But in six years time, I'm actually having to take the first set and the seventh, uh, the twelfth set off the wall. So it suddenly starts to build up. Um, so the volumes will start start and increase. Uh, but that's an ongoing um, thing uh, and that will continue while they have that strategy. Thanks, Amy. All right. So I mentioned I mentioned that some of these uh, have, have now disappeared. Um, <clears throat> so in effect, the discusa still exists. Um, Electroslink still exists because it does the transmission of the networks and so does Electron. The one that you'll notice that's disappeared um, off there is GemServe because their role has, has changed and in effect the Macopa will disappear off there because it now falls under the REC. The roles of Bayes and the Office of Products and Safety Standards hasn't changed, they still continue um, uh, and the role of Decusa hasn't changed. What is interesting though is there were certain activities originally under the Decusa and under the Macopa um, that that ceased to to operate during uh, when when the first transition to the wreck, uh, and some of those things have now been put back in. So the one thing that has been put back in is there is now um, an electricity uh, operational electricity metering operational forum, um, which invites the councils of parties and supplier parties and, and MEMS together to discuss issues, and those are now held once a quarter. Whereas those discussions were either held at either Decusa or Macopa going forward, it's now being brought into one central um, type activity. Although the Decusa still does uh, does meet under separate uh, as a separate entity, but at least there is now a forum where everybody can discuss and bring bring forward issues. So that has been a, a huge amount of progress just lately. Thanks, Amy. Okay. So I've given you a hell of a lot of information there to start with. So how it all fits together. So generators, as we've said, responsible for generating the electricity. Most generation stations, um, they try to keep uh, in certain areas where they're going to have water or fuel or transmission lines or anything like that. Um, will generate to a local environment. However, the, with, the, with, the, with the invention of the national grid, the whole idea was you can drop stations in and out of use and therefore don't lose power, you can transform them. 
So generating out of a power station, um, you have to generate a huge voltages. Uh, and the reason that you have to generate a huge voltage is the easiest way to think about it is, um, and I wish they taught me it this way at school, basically if you think about voltage, it's like trying to push the electricity down, down the wire. Um, so the higher the voltage, the more useful energy you're going to get out the other end. The unfortunate thing is the size of the wire, the distance and everything else that's connected to it stops it from getting there. So that's the resistance. And then the current that you get out of it at the other end is the useful part. So from a generation station, you can be coming up to around about 475,000 volts um, through your overhead transmission lines because you stepped up to that. And then it'll come down to 75133 uh, 11 kV um, down as you get it down closer to where you need to be. And once it gets down to around about 11,000 volts, the di uh, distribution substation is where the distribution network operators take over. So once it's getting into the local networks, uh, at that point, it becomes the DNO's responsibility. They'll then carry on transforming it down as to where they need it. Mm. And it depends on who needs it, what's the what takeoff point they're actually going to use. Uh, and where they're going to where they're going to use it to. So for argument's sake, for some of the big industrial type pro properties, they may be taking it off at high voltage at 33,000 volts at 11,000 volts just because of the sheer amount of power that they're actually using it. Down to your smaller offices or uh, three phase type operatives down at 415 volts down to your standard house at 230 or as I mentioned earlier, it can be 240, but um, it's supposed to be 230 volts. So the distribution network operator will get it into the house. They'll terminate it at, at the property uh, into what we call a cutout or a service termination point. And it's not until that point that the meter operator or meter equipment manager takes over. So you can see the size and scale um, of the responsibilities um, for, for each one. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Emma. OK, so. Uh, yeah, Richard, I, I can. I can yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I can. Def I, can de I can definitely have that to uh, I'll put it into chat when I remember what it is. Just a reminder to everyone that the meter OK, have we any questions? Don't know whether we can hear you properly there, Amy. It's a bit, you're a bit uh, quiet there. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing that's come through on the chat function, you can use that if you want to. I think Amy was just reminding everybody, anybody that joined a little later and didn't notice that, ah, there's another one just come through. You can use the Slido, um, you can join us there to ask questions. I think that's another one there for you, Dave. Yeah, yeah. the difference between operational meter and a settlement meter. Okay, yeah, it's a, it's one of these that's that, that's an interesting in question interesting question because it depends on where you're looking at uh, looking at it from. Well, thanks. Sir. I think somebody's just posted the, uh, the the thing into the into the uh, into the chat of where it's from. Um, okay, so operational metering, uh, and it depends on, on on what concept you're looking at, but it's an it's an interesting thing. So settlement metering ha is a defined term. So settlement metering is anything that is used from a billing purposes for for supplier type activity, whereas operational metering tends to more be around um, monitoring activity. Now there is a there, there is an interesting thing of that. So for a for a if you think of a domestic property. Um, you could have a settlement meter uh, at the boundary point to the to the property, uh, and that would be the one that the supplier charges you on. Um, so the supplier might charge the landlord, but the landlord might then decide. Well, actually, what I want to do is in each one of my flats, I want to have a, what you would call a secondary meter, 
but that secondary meter it actually belongs to the landlord and is not part of the supplier or all the MEMS equipment, but it allows the landlord to know who's using what. Now there are rules and regulations as to what they can what they can charge. Customers they're only allowed to charge so much over what they're making. But in certain circumstances, operational metering can tend to fall outside um, this sort of activity. It, it tends to be more from a from a, a, a monitoring perspective than it does for for billing. If that makes sense. Can you hear me now? Have I managed to get around the technical difficulties I was having earlier? You are, Herma. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Apologies, everyone, for that. Um, so we haven't had any further questions come in as of yet. Would you like to move on to the next section? We can do. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> so we've looked at the, the, the big end of stuff that's all in effect outside the control of the REC. So even though it's outside the control of the REC, um, they still have an influence. Uh, and, and as interested parties, you can still influence those things. Now, it might be the case of that that has to go through a cross code working group. So I mentioned earlier about Alexon and the, and the, uh, the balance and the settlement codes. They don't sit under um, the REC. However, uh, with the cross code working group, so prime example, uh, market wide half hour settlement, uh, is one that's been managed outside the REC, but it will have a re an, an impact on REC parties. <clears throat> so they're having to work together to, to, to actually come to a, a solution on how that will work. So there are a lot of that activity is going through the, um, the cross code working groups. So what can we influence? So if you want to go onto the, onto, onto the next slide, please. All right. So. <clears throat> In electricity, there are in effect three ways that we can manage it and, and three pieces of term, terminology that we tend to use. Whole current, CT operated and CT and VT. And we'll take whole current first of all. Whole current um, metering is what we would class as our low voltage type activities. So small shops, very small commercial and domestic main domestic promise premises. There are some domestic premises that fall outside this and I'm not going to differentiate between three phase and, and a single phase at the moment. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that in a, in, in a little bit, but. In effect, the distribution network operator, as I mentioned, is, is responsible from the local distribution zone takeoff point right up to this little fuse that's in now in your customer's property. From that point onwards, it then becomes the meter operator's responsibility. And now the difference being with this type of activity is all the electricity flows through the meter. Now it only shows one cable here. There are four cables. There's two coming in and two going out. So live neutral going in, live neutral going out. And I'll show you that in a bit. In, in, in a bit. But for simplistic terms, the main thing to remember with this type of metering is that in effect all your electricity goes through the meter. So there's no way of, of bypassing this without doing something illegal. There is the, the customer, if you pull the main fuse, the meter goes off, the customer's equipment goes off, and exactly the same thing is if they take the meter off, that's it, that that's that system shouldn't operate unless they bypass it, uh, and but the meter will, will stop registering. <coughs> Uh, and that that's that's how that works. In effect, the only additional thing that we've done with smart is connected some um, type of transmitter receiver to the meter that allows it to send information back backwards and forwards um, to the to the um, smart smart teams. So through smart DC. There are there is some additional functionality in the meter that we can do. We can change the tariffs and all sorts of other stuff remotely. But in reality, that's the only piece of new equipment that's been added to the metering part itself. When we look at current transformer operated, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention why we start to use that. So the maximum that we can put through a whole current system is round about for domestic will be round about 100 amps. 
anything over 100 amp, um, the maximum size meters that they currently make are 100 amp meters. Now, if it's, it could be a 100 amp single phase meter or 100 amp three phase meter. Anything over that, we then start to have to look at what we call current transformer metering. Now, if you think of what the size of a 100 amp meter is currently, you could imagine that if I put a 200 or 400 or 600 amp meter in, the size of the meter would have to get bigger because the electronics would have to get bigger, so it would take up more space. So we cheat. The main cables go straight to the customer, so the customer is permanent in oil supply. What we do is we wrap what we call a current transformer around the cable and we only monitor five amps worth of the current. And the reason that we do that is that the metering can remain small, the equipment can remain small and it doesn't take up as much space, but also um, it allows for the customer's equipment to be permanently connected. Now, for some of these organisations, that's essential so if you imagine that metering system was in a hospital or somewhere like that, I can actually isolate that current transformer, change the meter and the customer doesn't lose any power. It means that they can remain on all the time. But it also means that somebody could fiddle with the meter and still keep the power on. Um, and, and we do see that happen. Um, and, but there are monitoring systems in place to, 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 to solve that issue. But in effect, if you say you've got a 200 amp incoming supply to your customer and you're only measuring five amps, in effect, you've got a ratio of 40 to one. And that's what we do within the meter. So if the meter was measuring five amps, we know that the, the, the supply should be at 200 because it's at 200 to five, we times it by 40. And that's what we do with the readings. So if it's 400 to 5, 600 to 5, we're still measuring based on ratios. When you get up to high voltage stuff, um, because it's not coming in at 230 volts or 200 or 415 volts anymore, it could come, be coming in at 11,000 volts or 33,000 volts or even bigger. We can't put that amount of voltage through the, through the meter. It wouldn't do any good. So we still do exactly the same thing. So this time we have a current transformer on there and a voltage transformer. So the voltage transformer will reduce the current, reduce the voltage down to 110 volts. And the current transformer again will reduce it down to five amps. So on a 33,000 um, incoming supply, the current transformers will take it down to 110 volts. If it's 11,000 volts, again, they'll bring it down to 110,000 volts. So the conversions for the calculations are all done in the meter. But again, the power goes straight through to the customer. The controls and everything else are in the control of the meter, uh, meter equipment manager. Now, there was some changes in the legislation on how we fit these things. So now distribution network operator is, is responsible for fitting the current transformers, voltage transformers and a panel for the meter equipment manager then to mount their equipment to. So in effect, the meter equipment man manager is now just connecting the meter and the final connection. They don't do all the other work. That's the distribution network operators um, responsibility. Uh, and those changes have taken place in the Macopa and the Decusa just to define whose responsibility those are. But they're the basic systems that you can connect up. So you've got low voltage, CT operated, whole current, low voltage, and then you've got your high voltage current transformer and voltage transformer. OK, next one, Amy, please. All right. So just for defining just on a standard um, customer's equipment, um, who's responsible for what? So the incoming supply we mentioned is the responsibility of the distribution network operators. So if you see the items one, two and three listed there, you've got your incoming cable, your cutout, your fusing, your, your live side and your neutral side and the earthing. 
So the earthing is a distribution network operator's responsibility. Coming off the top side of the cutout, then the brown cable's live, the blue cable's neutral. Um, and if you notice, um, for any of those as, as, as old as me, they used to be red and black. We ended up moving to the European standard of brown and blue. So um, it's the same as your plug top now instead of different wiring systems. So your cable that goes from your cutout to the meter is the responsibility of the, the uh, meter equipment manager and then out of the meter and there might be a time switch or isolator or something like that there. If it's an isolator, dependent upon the contracts with the customer, it will be either be the customer's responsibility or the MEMS responsibility. It will be dependent on how and why it was fitted. You can see on the top of that meter, there's a communications hub because that's a smart meter, so it's direct coupled. There are instances where that's um, kept connected remotely through a, either a flying lead or direct off the cutout. It is still the responsibility of, of the meter equipment manager. Those comms hubs in effect are rented from the DCC. So when the supplier orders the meter and everything else, they order the comms hub uh, and they pay a rental charge. If that stops communicating or anything like that, it's the suppliers, the electricity supplier's responsibility um, to organise for that to be rectified. So even if it was the gas people that were having a problem, it belongs to the electricity side. Uh, they're responsible for it. The interesting one are the tails that are coming out um, of the meter. Now, because they're going to a time switch, the time switch belongs to the, the, the meter equipment manager. If those went straight to the consumer unit, they belong to the customer because they are on the customer side. And if you notice, the earthing connection is the responsibility of the customer. So meter, meter equipment managers do not get involved in earthing. So even on a new connection, it's up to the distribution network operator to provide the earthing and the customer's electrician to connect it. The meter operator's there to put, or the, the MEM's there to put the meter in and the answer and the associated equipment and get it live. Okay, next, please, Emma. There is one um, other organisation that we've not actually talked about. And that's a building network operator. Uh, and these didn't used to exist years and years ago. Building network operators came to fruition um, because what happened was certain distribution network operators decided um, and through agreement that what happened is their responsibility stopped at the intake to the building. So they would go in and provide a supply to the building. Now, in their infinite wisdom, um, building upper building companies and building organisations then said, well, actually, I might have 10 flats per floor uh, and I need a rising main that goes up and I don't want the metres in the cellar where the, the main cutout is. I want the metres where the customer can see them and I want the metres to be able to be used by the customer. So therefore, I want a metre on each floor. So what they did is they got permission and connected um, their cables straight into the cutout and up to a secondary cutout next to the meter. So that, the, that provided the meter with some uh, isolation point. The meter was then connected and then off into the customer's property and, and, and the, the, the um, power connected which is great because now the customer's got direct view of the meter. And if you think that customer might have, a, might have had a prepayment meter, they can get to it without living on the top floor and having to go all the way in the basement and, and, and at one point put money in it. They can do it straight outside the flat. What some organisations didn't realise is there is a, a piece of legislation called ESQCR. So the Electricity Supply Quantity, uh, Quality and Continuity Regulations. And under those regulations, what happens is you um, become a building network operator and you assume responsibilities for that cable. So therefore, if anything happens to that cable or anything that happens to the, the connection between the, the distribution network operators cut out and the intake point to the meter, the building operator is responsible. 
So you can imagine a lot of these organisations and a lot of these buildings that are in, um, you know, city centres and things like that may be owned by management companies and the management company be, could be in Dubai. Uh, and one of our meter equipment manager goes along to fit a meter or change something and notice that the, the intake cut out um, on the first on the upper floor is broken. That belongs to the, to the building network operator, not to the DNO. And you've now got real problems to find out who owns the building, who's responsible for the management of it, uh, and therefore getting it repaired and leaving it in a safe condition. Um, because if you ring the distribution network operator up, they're rightly going to turn around and say, I'm sorry, it's not ours. Um, it belongs to belongs to the building. Now that's not the case with every DNO. So some DNOs in some parts of the country have said, actually, we put them in years and years ago, we'll maintain responsibility for them because nobody else knows about it. Other areas have said, no, we stop at this point. So dependent upon where meter operators are working, you can find slightly different rules. All right, but it's been worth being made, being aware that the only responsibility in that for a meter equipment manager and the supplier is actually the settlement meter. They're the only bits that they're actually responsible for. They'll connect from the um, auxiliary cutout to the, the consumer unit. So they've got to provide the tails of the uh, customer's electrician and we'll connect, we'll connect them up. So um, at that point, we, uh, we don't have any additional responsibilities. All right, but it's, it is one of these that's uh, quite confusing for organisations and, and for many organisations and companies are not aware that they've got that responsibility until something happens. Thanks, Emma. Hey, we just had a question on there saying if there's no isolator or time switch, yep. the neutral and live belong to the customer then. Can right. the customer have an isolator installed by an electrician? Um, OK, in reality, no, there, there are many, there are many uh, sorry, customers that have asked electricians to fit one to currently to fit an isolator. And there is a change going through um, through the, the MCOP at the moment um, to change that piece of legislation or to change that how it works. So currently you have to be a, a, a MCO, an MCOP, uh, sorry, a MCOP operator um to actually fit an isolator because you've got to break the terminations on the meter and you're gonna to have to pull the cutout fuse to do it safely <clears throat> so no an electrician can't or shouldn't do it that's not to say that they haven't been doing it uh, and there are many instances where it has been done but it is not the way to do it so there is a change trying to go through to to make it easier for customers and um associations and everything to get an isolator fitted. There are some suppliers when they fit the smart meters are fitting isolators in due course at the same time. There are many others that don't. Thanks and there's another couple of questions through on the chat. How do you know if you're working on a BNO setup? Brilliant question. Um, until you get there, you don't. So the only thing that you would potentially do is that you would end up ringing the distribution network operator and asking the question. <clears throat> now we know for a fact that, um, so for argument's sake, there is a document out by, um, for argument's sake, UKPN, so UK Power Networks, um, for certain areas that basically says that they don't own any building network setups. So you know full well that in that area that doesn't happen. In some of the other areas, that's not always the case. It's also it's worth looking on the distribution network operators' sites. They do have some information about BNOs on those. For so if you're working in a specific areas, it is worth having a review of that, or even getting your organisation to get in touch with them to ask them how they deal with those situations. Thanks, Dave. And another couple of questions through. Uh, if you have <coughs> trained smart meter engineers, they can fit isolators, but they're not working for a specific supplier. Yeah, and that's the change that's going through at the moment. So the, the ruling under the, on, on, under the, the, the COP 
basically says that you're only allowed to work on behalf of the supplier. So if you are working on behalf of the supplier and you are the responsible men for it uh, and they've gone through their supplier and asked you to fit one, that's not an issue. What you can't do is go fit one where you're not the, the mem, the appointed mem via the supplier. So that's the change that's going through uh, through Macop at the moment. Um, right, and then I think we've had a, a comment here saying I've had a case recently involving a BNO in cross metering where one flat went off supply and the next door and the next door neighbour's flat were on a prepayment, didn't have credit. Yes, yes, um, and that's one of the responsibles with the, the, the issues with BNOs and cross meters can be can be can be a challenge because it could be across two meters, uh, two suppliers as well. Uh, and that then becomes very interesting on who who did the cross, how long's that cross been there, who's responsible for it. Uh, so yeah, they do they do uh, be, come with their own challenges to BNOs, unfortunately, uh, and it's something as an industry probably needs to be looked at. Uh, there's a question there: Who's responsible for the backboard? Yeah, this one's come up come up numerous times. So when we first started the transition from um, from from public industry to private industry, uh, this 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 uh, issue came up, uh, and in, in effect, the distribution network operators fit them in the first place uh, when they fit the cutouts in a lot of cases, or it could have been the meter operator that fit them, and in, 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 because they put them on a separate board. In effect, it went to Ofgem and Ofgem made the ruling uh, and, and, and the, the same ruling happened with outside meter cabinets. The Ofgem ruling and there is, a, there is an, an Ofgem letter um, for this, but basically it states that the anything like that is classed as part of the fabric of the building and therefore is the consumer's responsibility. So it's the property owner's responsibility. Now the downside with that is the only way that the consumer can change it is to contact the distribution network operator or the meter operator. Um, so, so they work in conjunction to, to try and resolve those issues. But in reality, if you, if you even if you make a new build now, the customer is responsible for providing the equipment to mount the metering and the cutout top. So going future proofed it's uh, it's solved itself but even then you'll still have to contact the distribution network operator or the meter operator to to change the to change the equipment so it has to be a a, a liaison visit in effect to, to actually um, sort that pro problem out so a couple of other questions have come through um, how yeah. do suppliers know when a request would be for the BNO to help with the customer's request? Um, in effect, I would be very surprised if you actually got a, a request from a BNO. The only time that you would get a request from a BNO is if they know that they've got an issue um, and they would potentially know that that's what they're requesting. Um, you will normally get it from an electrician that says there's a riser and it's doing this, it's arcing and sparking, can you come and have a look at it? And it'd be when you get on site that you find out that, that uh, it's a building network operator through further investigation. A lot of, if I'm absolutely honest with you, for most organisations, they will not know that they are a building network operator and it's an ongoing issue. Thanks, Dave. Uh, next question on the topic of electrician responsibility, where they have caused theft, shall they be taken to court? Yeah, it's um, it's something that um, UK RPA, so the UK Revenue Protection Agency, have been fighting for quite some time, and um, we've had it uh, a lot with um, electricians and everything else. We've had a lot with customers. In, if I'm absolutely honest with you, there, there are some that have been taken to court, but potentially not as many as they should have been. So we've had it before where um, councils or housing associations have gone in to do uh, renovations at a customer's property who's had a prepayment meter. And rather than ringing them up and saying, can, can you come and sort this out? They're on a prepayment meter, they're out of credit. The electrician shorted it out so that they can do some work. 
Uh, and when we get there, that's what we find. That's what we find. Um, you'd be surprised what stories you actually get when you go out on site as to um, why a meter has been tampered. Um, I had one well, it's a lot of years ago when it was the old dial type meters where there was a shelf below the meter. Um, but the crack happened to be in the top of the meter where the spoon was jammed in it. Uh, and the customer tried to be convinced me that um, the tin of beans had fallen off the shelf below it and hit it on top and bounced a spoon in there or fork. Um, I was trying to wrap my brains for the day that gravity switched itself off, but uh, it uh, didn't come to fruition with that one. Um, we've had many, there's a number of people that break into people's houses and tamper the meter for them, astronomical. Um, Sometimes it's difficult to take people to court if we're absolutely honest. Um, however, there are times when it has happened, um, potentially not as much as it should do. The big thing I would say now is the um, organisations are working close with Electricity First um, to try and work with their members to say, you know, under certain circumstances, you need to contact us instead of doing this, you're putting yourself at risk. So hopefully they are getting less um but never say never um some of them have been taken there thanks dave uh, no further questions at this point okay right we shall move on to the to the last section then changes to the rec then okay if you want to go on to the next slide so there are a number of, of, of changes that, that have happened. Um, so SMICOP, so the Smart Installation Code of Practice, um, currently has just been lifted and shifted um, under the REC. So it was under its own governance. It now sits under, sits under the REC itself. The MACOPA, which we've talked about quite, quite a lot today, um, so the MACOPA document has been moved under, on, on, under the REC but the years disappeared now. It's now called the, the, the MOCOP, uh, and I'll show you where that is in a minute. The other thing to be aware of with the MOCOP is that there is also a huge piece of work being done called the core consolidation um, activity. Uh, and what they're doing is that they've looked at taking the electricity code of practice and the gas code of practice and converting them into one metering code of practice. Uh, and there's good reason for doing that. So for argument's sake, so some of the health and safety stuff is exactly the same for both. Um, some of the requirements of how you treat customers and, and what you're supposed to do on site, the vetting of your staff and those type activities is exactly the same for both. So for some types, uh, for some things, there is a good reason to do that. What's that also led on to is to the looking at um, changing the um, auditing structure that says, well, actually, if I've already been audited and I can tell you my health and safety policy works like this, why are you asking me the same question again just because it's electricity, it's still the same policy. So again, um, there is a consolidation piece on looking at um, how that works. And I think if I'm correct, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the, the um, the consultation has just closed on the on, on the MCOP, hasn't it? On the consolidation piece. Um, so yeah, they've they still got until this evening. I believe. Is it still this evening? Yeah, right. I was going to say it's the last day today. It's R47. Right. You can get it from, uh, if you haven't already seen it, you can uh, take it off the REC portal and it is it closes today. I knew it was imminent. <laughs> So, so there's a, there's a lot of work being done on that. So, if anybody wants to go and have a look at that after 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 this, it is definitely worth a look, uh, and it's definitely having a look at worth looking and commenting on if you if you've got them. So, the last two parts, the Macopa technical decisions and the Macopa audit. Now, what happened you is we used to hold one Macopa meeting, uh, and there was a Macopa review panel. Um, that looked at the technical decisions and everything else, and then they did work groups. So those things have been split out in effect. So the Macopa technical discussions uh, and decisions now fit in within the REC metering expert panel. However, there is also now an electricity metering operational format forum that discusses some of that activity. 
uh, and that's that's just been reintroduced. The MACOP audit pilot activity, and this is the new part, even though we've done audits ever since we brought the MACOPA in, is that it now has its own performance assurance board. And that means that it not only looks at um, the technical type activity, it looks at the data and all sorts of other stuff that's associated with it. Uh, and therefore, it now follows very similar to how Elexon works with their PAB, which basically says if, if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, then you've got a board to answer to that then makes the ultimate decision of what if any sanctions are, is it a pass, is it a fail, what do we do next? And also off the back of that, if there are issues looking at process improvements and, professional, and, and, and continuous professional development. So there are some huge changes within those, um, but that's what those panels are, are designed to do. Right, next slide, please. OK, so. I've talked a lot about the the MACOP and, and, and the document now that Mr Rock kindly showed me another way into this, but I'm going to show you show you the, the, the. So there are two ways into this document. So for those of you are members of um, the, the uh, portal. Now signing up for the portal, anybody can sign up. Um, so if you are interested in the documentation uh, and where it is and what it looks like and what it's designed to do, then it is definitely worth you signing up. So signing up is dead easy. Basically click the top right hand button. Uh, you can see it's got my name on at the moment, but you can say, click, on, click on there. You can give them the reason why you wish to sign up. Uh, and then if once approved, you get access to certain parts. Now, there's some areas that you won't, you won't have access to um, because they're locked down, but as certain members, you will get access to other areas. So for, for me to get into here, the way that you can get into it, uh, if you're not a member, is, excuse me, if you just go click on my dashboard, in effect, it opens up the committees uh, and it opens up the documents on the right hand side and you just click on um, digital rec and email or the, uh, the documents and it will take you to it. If you log in, it takes you in a slightly different way. So if you just go to the next page. Um, before I go to that, I'm just going to show you something else. So. Once you've logged in, uh, if you remember, you can actually go in and see which parties are capable of doing what. So in this participant management screen, you can see on the second box down on the left hand side where it says Rec Party Register. Uh, if you clicked on that, it opens up a spreadsheet. And if you just click on, if you just um, go to the next slide, Amy, please. And I'm, I'm not going to take you into in, into these because just for, for those that aren't members um, of GDPR purposes, but you can see at the bottom there there is a list of accredited rec parties, uh, so seeded rec parties, gas MEMS, M MCOP meter installers, uh, and MCOP accredited parties. Okay, so if as an organization you were looking for an accredited party to do some work for you or want to understand what accreditations a party has got, you can log on to that page, click the bottom. It will not only give you what the party is and their registration number, it will give you the contact details of how to get in touch with them. So if you look at the, at the top of this screen, this is updated regular. That's the data I actually went into and so it um, so in effect some of that data could have changed depending on new parties joining, parties leaving. So I wouldn't recommend that you save a copy of this. Um, always go into it live um, so, so that you've got the correct up to date details for it. But what it does do is, is allow you to have a look and see who's relevant for what your organisation needs. OK, if you go back to uh, next to me, please. So to get to this bit, if you remember down the left hand side the, uh, of the screen, there was um, a, uh, a line item that said EMAR. So the energy markets architecture. Um, so in effect, in here it holds all the documents that you would actually need to look for. 
And if you look on the bottom left hand side where it says metering arrangements, you can see one that says metering operations. So you can see the ASCOP, the electricity MACOP, which is the one that we're, we, we've been talking about. That is where you would find what used to be the MACOPA document. What will happen at some point is that that will disappear uh, and it will become the MCOP um, as if once, once approved and, and everything sorted out. So once that consolidation activity changes. Now, the advantages of the MCOP is it's a searchable document, so you'd actually be able to see what codes apply to you. So they are working on that. So if you just press the next one, Amy, please. OK. So it actually in this case, it takes you straight into the actual email, into the document itself. And you can just work your way through it. So it tells you everything that you would need to know. Who's it responsible for? So you can see there it's responsible. You know, it's mandatory for distribution network operators and metering equipment managers. So if you're in one of those entities, this is a mandatory document. There is no way around it. OK, next statement, please. All right. So just one question in so far. Um, how did suppliers know if their MEM or MOP fail their audit as we rely on them performing in accordance to the standards? OK, so there, there is an obligation on MEMS to inform their suppliers um, if if they fail. For um, what you can do is you can log on to that site uh, and it will tell you who's still active and everything else. Um, there is some work going on on the um, MCOP and one of the things it does state in there is that the scheme auditor um, will notify. Let me get this right. I think they, they only notify the the applicant. I don't think there is an obligation currently for them to notify, notify the supplier. And one of the challenges that they will potentially have is that they won't know which supplier that the, those organisations are working for, because they could be working for multiples. Um, so I think I think it's just a case of whether there's something in the contract that the supplier has with the MEM that says, you know, you need to audit them and it's part of your due diligence. So. I shall give you, I think I just got a hand up. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say, so if if you wanted to find out, um, so, so the, the MEMS get an accreditation certificate once they've passed their audit. So if they haven't, um, if they have failed their audit, then you can ask the code manager and they should be able to, to tell you that. Um, we're also looking at, um, as, as part of the the ComCop, the, the the new set of consolidated arrangements, we are looking at having an accreditation logo and register linked to that as well. So parties will be able to see on the portal automatically if a um, if one of the MEMS are actually accredited or not. Thanks, Asia. I think I think the main thing is is to make sure the suppliers, if there is anything, uh, and I know we we've done this work with some is basically to ensure that within your contracts that there is a, an obligation on MEMS if there is any change in their status that they have to notify the supplier. Whether they do that or not is a completely different thing, um, but it will be definitely worth putting in there. OK, that's the last of the information I had. Uh, if anybody's got any other questions or thoughts. So another question just come in. MPG um, are the only DNO who require their own certification to work in their area. Is this likely to change? Um, they're not the only ones. SPAW also have it. Um, so there is a, there has been a number of conversations with them uh, and and Spau. I think it's Spau. Let me get it right. Um, uh, and therefore, um, yes, it's been it's been an ongoing thing for a lot of years. Um, 
what we can't do is dictate to uh, t- to them how they manage their business. Uh, so there has been a lot of challenges over the years. Now, some of that has changed. Uh, and once you've done their um, their initial assessment, and if you're part of SMICOP, if you're part of a USR, then you don't have to revisit them. Um, but yeah, you're right. It still is a it still is an ongoing challenge, um, and there isn't an appetite for them to change their mind currently. That's not to say that it won't happen in the future, but that's how it currently stands. Uh, how do you find out who the men for a given or who the men? Right. OK. Um, OK, so. Currently, um, it will be based on based on contracts. So the only thing where that you will be able to do that, that a, a supplier can have multiple MEMS uh, and it, I suppose it will be de- dependent upon um, the reason that you need that information. Um, so the only way that legally you could potentially do that is to have that conversation with the supplier uh, and give them a good reason for wanting that. Um, there is no register currently of which MEMS are working for which suppliers. Um, it's all held um, by the supplier because it's a supplier driven activity. Another question just come in As sometimes suppliers struggle with the Mayor commission process. It can be a battle between DNO and MEM, especially on older CT installation. Any advice? Uh, yeah, keep battling. Um, right. Uh, yeah, you're right. It, it, it does. It, it does cause some some issues. Um, now, I notice and I, and I don't want to. I don't want to drop this on him, but I noticed that there there there, there is an uh, an individual um, who's who's on this call that actually uh, does some work with uh, the Association of Meter Operators, um, uh, and he will be well aware of, of 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 this situation. So it may be worth taking that to the to the AMO um, half hourly metering um, forum um, to di- to dis- to discuss. There is an ongoing issue between suppliers and DNOs in, in relation to um, certification, um, getting metering certificates, getting CT certificates and everything else, um, depending on who held what. So the DNO on new installations is supposed to leave a, a, a certificate on site or details on site of what's connected, how it's connected uh, and, and what the ratios are. But, um, it is an ongoing issue and I don't think it's one that's uh, easy to resolve at the moment. There are clear observations, um, obligations within the MACOP. Um, so it might be worth having a look and pulling out if you can find the, the relevant part of the MOCOP that would help you uh, and going back to the DNO and, and saying, well, actually, you're not compliant with this or you, uh, mem, you're not compliant with this. Um, so therefore, it would be just a case of trying to trying to find out which bit it is and who's responsible. But there is quite clear in there who's responsible for which which parts. Can can tampering happen on CT and HV metering sets? Uh, yes, it can. If I'm honest with you, um, we've there have been instances. It is rarer on those type of things because there isn't the knowledge on how to do it. However, there have been a number where it has been done uh, and where it has been done, it's quite crude uh, on how they've achieved it. Um, so yes, you can you can find them. Um, the downside is from a supplier perspective, the costs are astronomical. So the amount of money that you can lo- lose um, is huge very, very quickly. Um, the biggest advantage being is that most now have um, automatic meter reading, automated meter reading on there and communications. So you've got an idea quicker if something happens. Um, but that's that, that's that, and that's another reason for making sure that those comms are working. It will keep your risk of, of uh, money loss down quite considerably. 
Thanks, Dave. Um, that's all of the questions that have come in through Slido at the moment. Um, <laughs> do we have anyone with their hands raised? Oh, we have another question that's just popped up. What was your estimated loss revenue for tampering? It was round about 110 to 120 million pounds per year, roughly. Um, so, yeah, as I was saying, that's all of the questions on Slido at the moment. I don't know if anyone has their hand up or if we've received any other questions through the chat. No, we're clear on the chat and no hands up. OK, I think we can move on then. Um, so that brings us to the end of our session. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, we have set up a feedback survey on Slido, which you should be able to see on your phones in a second. Um, and we would greatly appreciate your feedback on today's event. Um, so any feedback that you may have for us, please feel free to submit this. And thank you again and have a good afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for the questions. Thanks.